Welcome back, friends. This is Jeff Kasman, and this is Welcome to Tradition. This is part two of our special episode of Welcome to Tradition on the subject of Christmas. Now, in part one, Uncle Jim set out to spoil our fun, explaining that the determination of the date on which we celebrate Christmas was not motivated by historical accuracy, but rather by liturgical considerations. And then he went even further to tell us that there really is no truth to the modern legend that the song, The Twelve Days of Christmas, was a secret code used by Catholics to teach their children the faith during English persecutions. So uh, I guess I can say welcome back, Jim. <laughs> Glad to be here, Jim. <laughs> so let's talk about santa claus so moms and dads if you've got your young children in the room and you're not ready to have this conversation yet this is your warning we're going to talk about santa claus and and the first part of this conversation i think should start with center class so let me guess santa really does have pagan origins of course he does <laughs> of course i told you all the best catholic traditions have pagan origins Santa, as we know him today, is this really interesting mashup of Dutch and English pagan figures that were Catholicized, then corrupted by Protestantism, and then, I don't know, obliterated by U.S. popular culture. The name itself, Santa Claus, is a corruption of a corruption. It comes from the Dutch, Sinterklaas, which is a corruption of Saint Nicolas. So Sinter, Sinterklaas from Saint Nicolas, a legendary figure based fairly closely on St. Nicholas, patron saint of children, who brings children gifts on the eve of his feast, his feast being on December 6th. The name Santa Claus has since been anglicized to Santa Claus. The, um, the legends surrounding Santa Claus are a Christianization of similar legends around the German pagan god Odin, which we think we're not familiar with, but we all actually honor him once a week, even if inadvertently, in that he gives his name, Odin's Day, Wednesday. So if you ever wondered where we got that really weird and weirdly spelled day of the week, Wednesday, it's named as most of the days of the week are for pagan gods. So <laughs> the days of the week are have pagan origins, except for Sunday, of course, the Lord's Day. So is it licit for a Catholic to pronounce the day Wednesday? It has to be. This whole controversy about things having pagan origins, we're going to do it. We're going to do a show, Jeff. We're going to do a show on pagan origins and why it's okay for things to have pagan origins. All right. So let's talk about Christ Kendall. Uh, December 25th is a long way from the Feast of St. Nicholas, I mean, three weeks or so how was that gap bridged? Well, there was never any question about it until Martin Luther. Protestants being Protestants, Luther and his ilk wanted nothing to do with the idea of a saint as gift bringer. Just about every culture has some mysterious, magical gift bringer. They wanted no part of a saint as a gift bringer and absolutely not the observance of a saint's feast. So they moved the gift bringer, they made the gift bringer the Christkindl, the Christ child, and moved the date to Christmas Eve. And that's how the whole notion of giving gifts on Christmas, this wasn't until the 16th century. Now, if you thought that Christkindl sounds remarkably like Chris Kringle from three, at least three movies that I know of, you'd be correct. So we have to add into that mix the English figure of Father Christmas. This was an ancient figure, but became the personification of Christmas. And, and yes, he too was the Christianization of a pagan figure. All right, so I gotta ask, if, if this thing all started with Luther, and this was really a, a Protestant pra practice designed to kind of subvert authentic Catholicism, should Catholics even be giving gifts on Christmas Eve or, or Christmas. Or, sure, or... and do it with a Catholic spirit. Uh, Luther wasn't satisfied to just move the gift giving to Christmas Eve as opposed to the Eve of, uh, of St. Nicholas. 
But if, if you want to do the Catholic thing, also honor Saint Nicholas on his day. But, but Nicholas should, should not be the only saint that we honor on his day. So do the Catholic thing. If you want to do something beyond the Catholic thing, do it. But there's, there's no harm in it as long as it's done with a Catholic mind. And if you want to do it the American Catholic way, you supersize it. So it would be gifts on St. <laughs> Nicholas Day, gifts on Christmas Day, gifts on Epiphany. I'm sure there's another reason in there to do, do gifts at some point, right? Just supersize it. Absolutely. So uh, I think one must wonder, did, did God not give us these pagan figures or for that matter, these Protestant figures and their customs just so that they could be so readily Catholicized. I, I actually firmly believe that, Jeff. I mean, the good God who created us gave us longings in our soul. And before man, before all mankind knew of the one God and knew of the Redeemer, that, that itch needed to be scratched. And so they created these figures, these customs, which are very easily Christianized. And, and I'm, I'm sure beyond any doubt that's what God intended. He made us the way he made us. These things came out in the popular culture because they, they are intrinsic to us. And so they were readily Catholicized. And, and God did that very purposefully. Of course he did. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about basic, since we're talking about gift bringers, let's talk about the fat Santa. Ah, we've talked about how the dates gotten moved around, but how do we get from the gaunt figures of St. Nicholas, for example, or Sinterklaas, or Father Christmas, to this jolly fat fellow we know as, as Santa Claus? And this is where the popular culture comes into play. In 1821 in New York, a poem was published by the name of Old Santa Claus with Much Delight. And this described this figure called Santa Claus on a reindeer sleigh bringing rewards to children. By the way, this idea of gift bringer, bringer always has associated with it the bringing of gifts to good children. So this was actually a technique parents used to manipulate behavior. The publication of that poem in 1821 was followed two years later in 1823, again in New York, with the publication of another poem, A Visit from St. Nicholas. This is much more popularly known as The Night Before Christmas or Twas the Night Before Christmas. In it, St. Nicholas is described as being chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf, elf, a tiny little thing, with a little round belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly with a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer. Uh, so as an elf, he would have been very tiny. The imagery gained a lot of traction and Santa Claus evolved from this tiny little elf into a large fat man with the publication of an illustration by Thomas Nask in 1863 in Harper's Weekly. Now it's important to understand this was Civil War time. So in this illustration by Thomas Nast in 1863 in Harper's Weekly, Santa is dressed wrapped in an American flag and happens to be holding a puppet named Jeff. Jeff? What? <laughs> this, is an this is an allusion to Jefferson Davis, obviously Civil War figure of the South. So he you know, sort of reached its, its zenith in the drawings that Haddon Sundblom did for the Coca-Cola company in the 1930s as part of an advertising campaign. These represent the Santa that we all know with the chubby cheeks, the rosy cheeks, the hat, the, the beard, um, chubby, the ermine, the red. Um, that Santa we know is essentially a, a Coca-Cola advertising campaign phenomenon, which, which doesn't make it wrong. It's just we got to understand where it comes from. You know, of, of all the things that you've said about Santa Claus to date, I got to tell you that to me, the most offensive is to discover that Santa Claus was Yankee wartime propaganda against the good, peace loving Christians of the South. I mean, that's. that's Never mind a puffet named Jeff. <laughs> yeah, which, yeah, that's that's really taking liberties. Yeah. OK, so. I think most 
Catholics have probably heard, or at least thanks to you, they will now hear about this associated with with Coca Cola because that that shows the real triumph of American kind of uh, consumerism taking over this any remnant of religious kind of substance to it is is really blown out by Coca Cola. I mean, how how can you be more American than Coca Cola, right? There you go. So the, the pagan idea is that Odin is the gift bringer. The Catholic idea is that St. Nicholas is the gift bringer, and he does so on the eve of his feast. The Protestant idea then successfully shifts the gift bringing to Christmas Eve. If you think about it, what a, what a brilliant thing, right? They wanted all the attention away from Christ's mass. And so they shifted to this wonderful old soft, nice, jolly guy who brings gifts to people. And then the American idea is that it's Santa who brings the gifts on Christmas Eve. Right. This this jolly, absolutely secular fat fellow who bears no resemblance whatsoever to St. Nicholas. It's hard for me to understand why Catholics, I mean, traditional Catholics have this idea that if you don't sort of initiate your children in this modern American Protestant ritual, that somehow you're denying them their childhood. And I'm, I'm not saying that, that it's wrong. I'm just saying, I don't understand why the emphasis on it. Um, and by the way, these would be the same folks who decry the secularization, the commercialization of Christmas, and denounce Christmas trees and Advent wreaths for their pagan origins. You know, children in all cultures are told of imaginary beings and even imaginary stories about real beings. I mean, St. Nicholas is an example of that. He's a real being. The idea of gift, universal gift bringer, that's, that's an imaginary thing around a real person. Kids, kids are wonderful. They're guileless, but they're not stupid. If you leave them to their own devices, soon enough, they're going to sort out what is pretend and what is real. If you think about childhood, a great deal of the intellectual energy of childhood is spent trying to understand what is reality. And to make the distinction between what exists only in their minds and what exists in the real world. And oh, by the way, lest you imagine that this is only a childish pursuit, this is something the great philosophers, particularly Plato, spent a great deal of time on. What is the difference between the thing and the mental image that we have of the thing? If we simply tell them the stories that we would choose to tell them, whether it be of St. Nicholas, whether it be of Santa Claus or Santa Claus, and then leave them to their own devices, they'll figure it out. I mean, when my oldest, what is it with firstborns? We didn't emphasize Santa Claus at all. But one time I said, to, I said to my son, I think he was like six years old. I said, so what do you make of Santa Claus? He goes, it's totally fake. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, on what do you base that conclusion? He says, well, look, the, the roof is pointed. Right. And so if you put a sleigh right on the point of the roof, it's either going to tip to one side or the other. And so it's all fake. I'm thinking, see, kids figure this out. But we don't leave it at that. We go to a lot of trouble to convince them that it is real. And this is very premeditated on our part. So we take them to, well, we used to take them to the mall. I mean, malls and mall, malls malls are now ancient history right we take them to the mall santa we have pictures with santa we go through a lot of trouble we put the the, the footprints and we leave out the cookies and then the cookies are consumed and and it's all very cute but we 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 work very very hard to take it out of what they would very quickly figure out is pretend and and seek to make it more real than frankly i think we should I think that's a great point because, you know, my kids go to our, our town's Christmas parade and guess who's always last in the Christmas parade? It's Santa Claus, right? And he's, he's might be throwing out candy or he's got elves with him that are throwing out candy. You don't um, need to tell them anything. They're going to experience it in the culture. And, and then, you know, a week later, the library has a Christmas party. And <laughs> there the, he is again. There he is again. And the kids come home, they say, you know, uh, this Santa was different from the other Santa, you know, and they, they start telling me about, well, you know, Santa, you know, and 
And then I got all these strange and awkward questions to try and, and answer and somehow rack, wrap it back around to, well, it's actually St. Nicholas. Um, I, I think this is a great point. I mean, the, you're, you're going to get criticisms of, ah, you're, you know, you're being too serious about this. It's just a harmless little thing. But but I do have to agree is somebody's worked really hard to try and understand how to properly form children. Um, th th this does create a little bit of a problem of taking taking it out of the out of the intellect and will and imagination and into kind of a he's like an actor, right? And 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 kids know that you know actors doing things on TV that's not real, right? <laughs> right, they know that they know. Well, they, they do to a point. I mean, when they're real little, no, they don't know it. I yeah. remember one time my my um my mother's mother, who was a, a diminutive little little bit on the heavy side, and she got the fake beard of the Santa suit, and she showed up at the door with kids. And one of my younger siblings said, "Oh, look, Santa has exactly the same shoes as Ma'am Am." <laughs> <laughs> and the older kids are all looking at each other wink wink yeah yeah or uh one of my favorite you know movies is what is it the christmas story you know the, the famous one uh and, and santa's got a drinking problem right why does santa always smell like whiskey <laughs> you know um anyway well, let me ask about this but how does how does somebody know if they've kind of overdone it on the santa thing what, what would be a red flag if, if you're agonizing over when and how to tell them the truth about Santa, you overdid it. In, in fact, you shouldn't even have to think about it. You should never even have to have the conversation. Let things play out. If you're just cool about it and don't make too big a deal about it, you don't have to say anything. They figure it out. Um, so if you're agonizing about it, you're overdoing it. If you get upset because some neighborhood brat ruined the secret for your kid, you're overdoing it. If your child is sad when they find out the truth about Santa, you overdid it. If they cry and kids cry, you way overdid it. By the way, just as a cultural check, I asked a, a, a dear friend uh, in Italy. They have similar, um, similar circumstances with the Befana, the old witch-like lady who rides on a broom and delivers gifts to, to good children or coal to bad children on the Epiphany. And she said, yeah, now we do. We didn't used to, but now we do because we tend to make it overly real. And so kids, yeah, kids are, are fairly traumatized. And I was like, wow, you know, you can bet that they're, they'll be talking to the therapist about it, right? I mean, to whom is Santa important? To you or to the child? The real difficulty in making the myth overly real to them is that it undermines belief in real miracles. Hey, isn't isn't the fact of the incarnation sufficient? And, and that is real. And it will scratch the very natural itch that we all have for the supernatural, but it will scratch that itch in an appropriate way and in a way that will not ever disappoint them. Yeah, I love that. What what's the right thing then for for Catholics that are listening to this uh, who are raising children or who one day will raise children or maybe it's it's grandparents who are trying to become more devout in their faith and practice what do we tell kids about santa well, the, the first thing we be very very clear about is this idea of a benevolent gift bringer is is it's in every culture and so it's not wrong per se and i don't want to suggest that it is it's, I'm, I'm sure it's a mistake to make more of it than we should. In fact, because of the Santa parade, the Santa at the mall, the Santa at the library, the Santa in movies, the, Sam, the Santas everywhere, you don't really have to now, you don't have to tell them anything. They're going to hear about it. They're going to see it. They're going to experience it. I would say strongly avoid anything that's not natural in terms of trying, like working hard to create in them the sense that, oh no, Santa absolutely is real. Let them experience it as children and let them experience him not being real as children. But you, you interfere with that natural process when you make more of it than it deserves. So 
just let happen what will naturally happen. And and certainly, uh, unfortunately, it has to be said that there are no hard and fast rules about this. Not every child is the same. Not every family is the same. You know, some kids are going to be more inclined to believing in, you know, myths and fairy tales and so forth than others, like uh, uh, like your your firstborn you, you mentioned, um, just a natural uh, skeptic and uh, I suppose takes after his father and kind of a sour gloom. <laughs> um, at the same time, though, um, you know, if, I think it's just great to step back and say, what what is your Christmas experience like for your family? Is it all about Santa Claus and the gifts around the Christmas tree? If that's kind of the primary uh, orientation of your Christmas, then then yeah, there's a problem. And, and frankly, I remember growing up, my parents wanted to do the best thing they could. They loved their children. We grew grew up in a nice, you know, upper middle class family. Christmas was a huge blowout, right? I mean, it was just presents and presents and it just went on and on. It was kind of exhausting, right? The whole day long of opening presents. And pretty soon, you know, we had to say, hey, too much Christmas because somebody started, you know, crying and had a meltdown over <laughs> some insignificant thing, right? Um, if 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 that's the, the the center of your Christmas, something's wrong. I mean, certainly the more Catholic thing to do if you're going to do anything is tell them St. Nicholas will put coins in their shoes on December 5th and yeah. let, let the culture, let Santa play out in the culture. I mean, he's everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Great. All right. Let's let's move on and talk about some other Christmas things. Hopefully you're not going to blow this up uh, as well. Everybody loves the nativity scene and uh, Santa, as we know, we've now covered, I think, ad nauseum is a modern notion, really a, a creation of the 20th century, 20th century Protestants or, or secularists. Uh, and there's not really much Catholic about Santa other than this tenuous association with Saint Nicholas, which by the way, I'm gonna try and hold on to. That's my <laughs> that's my story. That's my you're story. just you're just twisting that shape over to puppet named Jeff. <laughs> I, I am still a little bit <laughs> irritated about that. Um certainly the the more Catholic custom in all of this is the nativity scene. And, you know, most Catholics have been told this great story about how it originated with St. Francis of Assisi. In fact, and, it did. And who doesn't love St. Francis? So, yeah, it did. In what fact, do you got to tell us? He, he created the first nativity scene in 1223, a small town in Italy in Umbria called Greccio. Um, interestingly, though, this was a, um, a, a, a live tableau, a living nativity scene with humans and animals cast in their scriptural roles. Now, these yeah. living scenes were, were common before. It, this wasn't the first of these scenes. It was the first time one of these scenes was used to present nativity. So the, the idea of these tableau has quite an ancient pedigree. They were used throughout history. And I'm going to guess <laughs> pagan origins. Of course, Jeff. <laughs> All right. So I think we've got... We've got this episode about pagan origins, uh, not just we're Pennsylvania. We're working on it. We're working on it. Yeah. So eventually, statues replaced the living participants, and these scenes grew into really elaborate affairs with richly robed figurines, especially the kings. I mean, you see some of the, uh, especially in uh, in Italy and in um, in Bavaria, where where um, uh, nativity figures are, are are quite a thing. That the, the, the kings are always so, so spectacularly beautiful. And they're, they're placed in these intricate landscape settings. It's just a marvelous thing. <clears throat> Very much a thing in Italy and Spain, this owing to the historical relationship between Naples in particular and the kingdom of the two Sicilies governed by the Bourbons out of, out of Spain. And so you see a lot of the same themes in the Neapolitan, which is sort of like the Neapolitan um, Presepio is, is sort of the, um, the zenith of Italian nativity scenes. You see a lot of the same things in Spanish nativity scenes where the culture there is also very, very big. Um, believe it or not, so we have St. Francis taking this, this pagan thing of the tableau, the living tableau, and making of it a Christian thing with the nativity scene, and then that morphing into 
scenes with figures and then figurines. But that wasn't a novelty. That actually was first, um, first encountered in the catacombs of Rome back in 380. It was actually a little, a little nativity scene with, with figures. Okay, so we're back to this whole pagan origins. <laughs> I mean, if it's that old, right, it must have pagan origins, yeah. In, in fact, it, it does, and it's quite a, quite a cool thing. So some people would assert that the absolute epicenter of the art of the Presetio, the nativity scene, is a long, narrow street in the very heart of Naples, via San Gregorio Armeno, St. Saint, Saint Gregory the Armenian. It's called um, the, the, the Via del Presetio, the, the street of the nativity scene. Now, the making of religious figures in this district is an ancient tradition. There are hundreds and hundreds of shops that make and sell these exquisitely beautiful figurines for use in nativity scenes that you can find throughout the world. Jim, wait, we're not going to pass so quickly <laughs> over the fact that you said an ancient tradition. Do you mean to say? Oh, I'm afraid so, Jeff. The business of making religious figurines there in particular began owing to the presence of a temple to the goddess Ceres, to whom worshipers brought the terracotta figurines. Now, the nativity scene that we, as we know it, um, commonly represents the figures of St. Joseph and Our Lady, the infant Jesus. There's an ox, the lamb, the shepherds, and somewhat anachronistically, the three kings. Well, that's, that's how we know it. In honestly, sort of Calvinistic United States. In other countries, particularly Italy and Spain, the scenes will also contain historical figures, uh, contemporary figures. You can be certain that right now, the artisans who make these statues are working diligently on figurines of the athletes who are playing in the ongoing World Cup. You can already find some of them available online. There's some beautiful ones of Messi, who plays for Argentina. Um, there are also stock characters that show up in, in, in depending on the style of, of that particular nativity scene. They show up in all the nativity scenes. Some of them are hilariously funny. Um, some are religious. Some are not. They're just profane. They're just they're just secular. You can find um, there's 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 Trump. You'll find whoever the sitting president of the United States is, and a lot of times they're caricaturized and they're. They're quite well done, and some of them, frankly, are more than modestly vulgar. But but Spaniards and Italians have a little bit less of a problem with vulgarity than the puritanical people of the United States do. Now, there, there are some customs that are associated with these nativity <laughs> scenes. Would you elaborate on that? Sure enough. I mean, one of, the, one of the really interesting things is this idea of placing contemporary figures in the nativity scene. See, Again, this, this idea that it has to be historical reality, that's sort of a modern and very much a, an Anglo-Saxon American engineering approach, historiography approach to devotion. You will find very often nativity scenes set in, in contemporary locations. And the idea of that is while... <laughs> This is why the date of the December 25th just doesn't matter. The idea is that the incarnation is something that we all participate in because the Lord God Almighty became one of us. And so the typical nativity scene is not always set in a manger. Often it'll be set in a little niche of a very beautiful um, building uh, with very beautiful architectonic themes um, with contemporary figures. The idea being the reality of the incarnation is something that we participate in today and that is part of our lives today. Another very, very, uh, I, I just think it's really quaint is the idea of the moving figures. Yeah. So yeah. The, the stable is empty. It goes up on, on uh, the first Sunday of Advent, but it's empty. And then somewhere... <laughs> Out in the household, you have the um, Our Lady uh, and, and the donkey and uh, St. Joseph. And every day you move them a little bit closer until like the day before 
on Christmas Eve. You put them in the in the, the stable, but you don't put a baby Jesus there. Not until midnight, yeah, if you're home, if you're not at midnight mass, but not before midnight. So maybe when you get home from midnight yeah. mass, Jesus in in the little um, in, at midnight. And so if if a Catholic, somebody who really knows better, if they put the baby Jesus in the manger before midnight, what kind of a sin is that? <laughs> it's not. They, it's, come on, Jim. They they it's know. A, it's a they faux know pas. Look, I know. I, I know. I'm mean spirited, but I'm not that mean spirited. <laughs> All right, so they don't have to take that one to confession. I think we're agreed. No, on. no, 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 no. Okay. Then of course we have the three kings. What do we do with them? Because they weren't there. So when when Yeah. Well, I mean, I think we know that the only licit day to put the three kings <laughs> into the nativity scene is January 6th, right? There you go. There you go. That that's when they arrive, not a day earlier. Not before, but but that see, what isn't that just a beautiful teaching tool? Because Christ. The, the 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 anointed one was made known to his who, to his intimates and the jewish people but he wasn't made known to the gentiles until subsequently and so the kids the kids see okay we're not yet not with the three kings then the three kings show up and then as they get older you can explain not just the devotion but now the the, the beauty and the significance of this king of all nations and in the heavens. Then, then the following liturgical year, you can talk to them about his kingship when we celebrate the feast of Christ the King. And it's it's all a whole. And that's why I can't, it cannot be emphasized enough. These things are devotional and liturgical. They're not intended to be historiography. Indeed. And just one final point that the uh, an interesting point that the kings don't arrive until January 6th in the liturgical calendar. And of course, that's after the 12 days of Christmas are, are complete. Now, we we have to talk about this other big issue. It, it's it's hanging over us. It's, it's taking up space in the room. We got to talk about the Christmas tree. And I'm going to guess something that's natural and ancient and primitive that we're going to erect and then all kind of be an adoration over for, well, a lot of people, of course, are going to start right, right before Thanksgiving, the Christmas tree. Hey. I'm assuming it's got pagan origins. Of course it does. <laughs> what did you expect? <laughs> well, folks, you've heard it here. We're going to do an episode on pagan origins and talk about yeah. it. So but look. I'm, but I'm guessing there's some every there's culture. some interesting story here, right? Every culture has used evergreen trees, wreaths, and garlands to symbolize eternal life. The idea of the circle, that's eternal. It has no start and no end. Okay. Um, evergreen, remember, this, this whole cultural thing comes out of, <laughs> the, comes out of the, the Germanic, <laughs> the forest in, in German, primarily German Europe, which in the winter is just a really dark, miserable place. And so the idea of an evergreen or holly or mistletoe, these things that are green throughout the cold winter season were revered as symbols of eternal life. Tree worship was common among the pagan Europeans and survived through their conversion to Christianity. And there are to this day, wholesome, sensible rituals which have been Christianized around trees in the Scandinavian countries and in, in Northern Europe. Um, during the Roman midwinter festival of Saturnalia, houses were decorated with wreaths and evergreen plants. The Vikings and Saxons worshiped trees as, as did the Germans. And of course we have that great story of St. Boniface cutting down the oak that was being worshiped by the Germans. Right, right. And the legend goes that a um, an evergreen sprouted up in its place, a symbol of um, of eternal life. The nativity scene is um, is a more of a Latin custom, Italian and Spanish in particular, and absolutely more more Catholic. I mean, it's unambiguously Catholic. The Christmas tree is more Germanic in its origins, as are many of the things that we do in the United States in terms of our celebration of Christmas. Now, if it troubles you that the Christmas tree 
was pagan in its origins, <laughs> you, you will find that much less troubling than the fact that it began as a Lutheran custom. I'm sure you can imagine that the rank idolatry of the Catholic figurines in the nativity scene would be a problem for the Lutherans. Um, those of you who see Christmas trees filling Catholic sanctuaries in your traditional chapels, you might be amazed to know that Christmas trees were essentially prohibited until 1982 with John Paul II, who first permitted a Lutheran Christmas tree to be erected in the Vatican. Christmas trees were considered Lutheran and they were discouraged in the church. And so we think of this longstanding tradition in the United States, it was true. In parts of Germany, it was true, but this is owing to the German influence in the United States and to the Lutheran influence in, in Germany itself. That's extraordinary. And I think now we not only have Luther's tree in the Vatican, isn't there a statue of Luther himself? Luther himself. Yeah. Probably yeah. a different episode for that. So <laughs> if we're going to have a Christmas tree, uh, when should we put it up? When, when is it lawful to put it up? So it's, it's not a matter of law. Um, it's a matter of custom. But customs, customs should... Um, should strengthen liturgical observance and not run contrary to it. So if it's not unlawful, you can still say that it's a bad idea to put it up on the Friday after Thanksgiving. And the, and the reason for that is things that we do in terms of the celebration of Christian feasts should conform to the liturgical calendar. And like everything else that we do, the, the essence of liturgy is that it is prescribed and that in conforming ourselves to liturgy, it becomes an act of obedience and considerably more meritorious than if we had done it only of our own free will. So holding off with anything associated with Advent and then Christmas until the first Sunday of Advent is just, it's an act of humility and it, it conforms to liturgy which is only ever a good thing. Um, some folks use the first Sunday of Advent as when to start decorating and then sort of bring things in a little at a time. Um, our own approach is nativity scene goes up on the first Sunday of Advent. At least that's our intent. Uh, and that is, and, and then, then we do the baby Jesus is never there. The three Kings aren't there. The shepherds are off somewhere else. And then we, we march them in a little at a time. Um, in Italy, December 8th, Feast of the Immaculate Conception is considered a good day to start decorating. In Mexico, December 12th, Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe serves the same purpose. It's sort of a benchmark. We will decorate for, start uh, decorating for Christmas on, uh, on December 12th. Incidentally, the Poinsettia, which, who, by the way, uh, which by the way are named for um, a Civil War figure by the name of Poinsett, um, these are indigenous to Mexico and not surprisingly play a considerable role in Christmas decorating there, which custom, fascinating to me, was started by the Franciscans. I love that. Uh, the red and the green, it's just so, so beautiful. By the way, they're not, they're not evergreen. Don't leave your, don't leave your, um, your poinsettias out uh, if it goes below freezing. I learned that the hard way. Yeah, some folks would recommend, I would be in this, this group, uh, really holding off on the whole Christmas tree thing, especially decorating the Christmas tree until Christmas Eve, given that it's it's still Advent and Advent is a penitential period, not normally associated with celebrating. What what do you say to that? I I love it in theory. Our own experience is, um, and part of that is due to the fact that we've got a lot of work to do to prepare for the singing at midnight mass and such that um, Christmas Eve day is we're, we're just slam busy. So we we'll, we'll put the tree up a little bit sooner, decorate it a little at a time and then sort of finish it off on Christmas Eve day. Um, but otherwise, uh, we just don't have the time uh, to get it done on Christmas, Christmas Eve day. I know some people also have the tradition of putting their tree up on Gaudete Sunday. 
given that it's a it's a Sunday of a little bit of more joyful spirit, looking forward to Christmas, even in the middle of Advent. What do you think about that? It, it, it's a rationale that, that at least speaks to the liturgical cycle. So in principle, I, I, I'd rather see that than have it be completely arbitrary or have it go up on the Friday after Thanksgiving. So Macro Conception or Lady of Guadalupe, Gaudete, Gaudete Sunday, just something. Then when you when you explain to the children or you observe yourself, we're doing this today because today is a day of rejoicing. Gaudete means rejoice and there's a reason for our rejoicing and that is because we're about ready to celebrate not the birthday of the baby Jesus. We can celebrate that too, but the point of it is we're celebrating the arrival into humankind of a great and mighty king who is here to redeem us. A few years ago when we still lived in a neighborhood, I saw my neighbor take his Christmas tree out of his house and throw it on the curb on Let's see, it was about 3 p.m. on Christmas Day. So is there is there a wrong day to take down your Christmas tree? Uh, not, not, not in terms of moral culpability, but for heaven's sake, the, 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 the celebrating the event of the incarnation is so enormous. That we, we, we want to milk it a little bit. That's that's why there was an octave. That's why there are the 12 days. We get, that's why the season endures until February 2nd, because it's so tremendous. How can you have a proper understanding of the gravity, the magnitude, the importance of the feast? If one of the key symbols, cultural symbols anyways, of the feast is on the curb at 3 p.m. on December 25th. No. So cul morally culpable, no. But but remember, we want to live according to the rhythms of the liturgy. And that means at least choosing a day that has something to do with the liturgy. And obviously some decorations should really should linger, right? They, they should. Uh, our preference is to keep those things that it makes sense to keep up until February 2nd, certainly in the nativity scene. Um, the, the Christmas tree itself, ours, I mean, even if we get it fairly late in the season, even if we don't decorate it, you got to get them before they run out. So you got to get it a little bit early and you can keep it watered and do all the right things that you need to do. But after a point, they become, they start to shed their needles. They start to become a mess and they do become something of a fire hazard. So we typically, ours is, ours is gone on January 7th. All right. I, I hate to ask, but <laughs> no conversation about a modern American Christmas customs would be complete if we didn't cover Elf on a Shelf. Oh, dear. <laughs> Harmless fun. I mean, some of, some of the stagings are, are just outrageously funny. There's some really, really clever people out there doing doing hysterical stuff with, uh, with that and, one. And, and this one, clearly pagan origins of course, of course. <laughs> we're, we're gonna do that episode <laughs> you know a woman had um posted on a, a trad social media group recently that elf on a shelf was to be avoided by catholics because uh, it's evil and because elves elves are demonic and i i gently very gently tried to point out that elves goblins fairies sprites and all this that they're that they're pretend the immediate retort was no, they're not. They're very real, and they are demons. I, I thought, and, and by the way, by the time I saw this, I had, had started to think through this whole question of, of, of the Santa thing and how children are supposed to learn to distinguish, and they will learn to distinguish between reality and pretend. And I, came to the, I came to the conclusion that some adults never, never really mastered that. You know, one of the things that's interesting to me about that kind of assertion is in, in modern day uh, kind of culture, elves are certainly most associated with the Lord of the Rings. Right, 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 which is holy, holy. Holy. I mean, my understanding, my recollection, it's been a long time, but I think the Silmarillion, I, I, it, weren't elves supposed to be the angels? 
Yeah, think, there's a whole, there's a whole, um, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? There's a whole sort of um, metaphorical yeah. schemata that, uh, that maps exactly to the cavalry paint. I, I'm, I'm not a devotee, to be very honest, but, but I know that to be true. And, yeah. and um, so I, I mean, I, I think they've even, you know, the, the people that are really into that have even broken it down to the point where, you know, the, the, the good angels were the elves, like the guardian angels were the elves protecting men, helping men and so forth. And the fallen angels were like the orcs or something. I mean, I, I think there's this whole elaborate thing. So uh, not to mention the fact that angels aren't in, in real life. We think about angels. They're not, you know, they're not physical creatures. They don't have matter. They're, they're spiritual beings. But anyway, it, I, I guess there's one final thing we should talk about. Xmas. <laughs> but we... We, <laughs> we see the billboards, uh, we, there's other materials people are always saying. I've even written it before when I'm especially typing a text message, Xmas, you know. And every now and then I run into somebody who's really upset about that, and, you know, and, and we got to keep Christ in Christmas. Um, there was in a social media group that you and I are both in, um, there was someone posting, you know, warning people, beware. Don't be deceived by by Satan. Greetings of Mary Xmas is blasphemy. This person said, "It's it's allegedly an antichrist message to deceive humanity." Mm. What do, what do you think about that? You know, there there actually is a very elaborate and very well codified shorthand for commonly used words in, in catechetical, ecclesiastical, canonical, scriptural, exegetical, liturgical writings. There's a literal reference to these. It's, a, it's like a dictionary of these abbreviations, which you can find very readily in the Catholic Encyclopedia. They are not an attempt by evil people to obliterate or subvert the use of sacred terms. When everything that was written was written by hand with pen and ink, such abbreviations were a great convenience. So you see routinely things like BVM, that's just well understood to mean Beata Virgo Maria, the Blessed Virgin Mary, or D tilde NUS, Dominus, or D tilde NE, Domine. There are literally hundreds, maybe thousands of them. The most well known one is RIP, Requiescat in Pace. Wasn't uh, is there any truth to the the story that Xmas is based on the, the Greek letter that looks like an X? Have, have you have you ever heard that explanation? Oh, it's it's absolutely and certainly true. Um, X is the first letter <clears throat> of the word Christ, which is a Greek word, Christos. And if you see Christ written in Greek, Christos, you see it written. With an X. So it's simply an initialism. X stands for Christ and nothing else. So yeah, there's there, that's that's absolutely true. Well, Jim, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, share these things with us to prepare and, and so forth. Uh, the date of Christmas, just as kind of as a recap, folks, the date of Christmas may or may not be the precise date on which our Lord was born. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. More importantly, right, that in the liturgical year, there is a, a link between March 25th oh. and December 25th. That's that's right. so look at your calendars. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Go look at your calendar if you don't already know in your missile. Look at March 25th and, and discover that link. That that's the more important thing, liturgical. That's more important. And by the way, there's a similar link between our, our lady's conception, December 8th, and nine months later, the birthday of our lady on September 8th. <laughs> Do the math. Absolutely. And the song, we've covered the song, the 12 days of Christmas really has nothing to do with the Catholic faith. And and pretty much everything that, that culturally we associate with Christmas does have some pagan origins. Again, that's, that's okay. not, yeah, not, not a problem. The, the more important thing is that the, the faithful have Catholicized those things, have made them into Catholic items of, of interest or devotion. And and Santa Claus, as he is commonly known in the United States and, and, and the times in which we're living, is really a, a mashup of pagan and Christian and modern customs. 
even the nativity scene, which who could argue against a nativity scene? Of course, Jim would argue against the nativity scene, but the nativity scene itself has some pagan origins. It's okay to admit that. It's okay to recognize how this has, has uh, to use another forbidden word, how it has evolved over time and, and what the proper place is in, in the Catholic faith for these things. Uh, and then also the Christmas tree is, is special because it's, it's pagan and it's Lutheran. And, and yet there's a way for, for Catholics to incorporate that into their customs and, and, and make it a Catholic custom. And finally, Elf on a Shelf, I think we all agree it's it's okay. Right, Jim? I would say so, yeah. As <laughs> dour as I can be. <laughs> and and abbreviating Christmas to the word Xmas, X-M-A-S, not a communist plot, not a demonic uh, attempt to subvert Christmas based on a, an abbreviation, a shortening of of a Greek word in which uh, X is a, is a Greek word that you all can look up. I won't tell you that one as well. You got to look it up and report back in the in the comments. Jim, any final takeaways that you have for us? I would say that um, it's very important, especially for fathers of families, but, but all of us, to keep in mind that the right way to celebrate Christmas is first to prepare for it spiritually, second to prolong the celebration of it, uh, and that the way to celebrate Christmas as a Catholic is in the liturgy. So starting with Advent by way of preparation, then uh, the vigil, Christmas Day and its octave, the 12 days, then Epiphany Tide, concluding essentially February 2nd. So a liturgical understanding. And consider that the liturgical incarnation cycle is not about a day and a date. It is about the fact of the incarnation. And that has antecedent to the Paschal cycle. This child was born. God became man so that he might die so that we might live. Everything else is secondary. Indeed. Thank you for that uh, summation. Remember, folks, today is Friday, uh, an ember day, Advent ember tide. And, and as Jim was saying, the church has done such a beautiful job in her wisdom of studying uh, mankind for, for two millennia now, has given us all these wonderful opportunities to prepare for things, to celebrate those things, to grow in discipline and sacrifice and love so that by removing our attachment to those things in our lives, we make more room in our lives for Christ. So today and tomorrow, for example, Ember Days, uh, if you don't know about those practices, uh, go back and look previous episodes. We've talked about Ember Days, study up, grow in the traditions of, of the church. Uh, and if we don't talk with you again on December 25th, have a, a wonderful Merry Christmas. Not before, right? And if you yeah. like this, if you like this episode, folks, please like uh, our channel, share the episode with your friends on social media. If you have any criticisms, of course, send those to uh, Jim DePiante. You'll find <laughs> Grump, grumpy Jim DePiante. <laughs> you'll, you'll find him on uh, on Facebook. Uh, thank you, folks, for being here. Uh, God bless you, and have a God wonderful you, Advent. A, a blessed uh, continuation of Advent, and a merry, very merry and holy Christmas season to all of you. God bless you. Goodbye.